Power Rangers, Nintendo 64, Blockbuster Video, the hysteria surrounding the impending Y2K catastrophe and subsequent end of the world. Just a few reasons to fondly look back on the 1990s. WWE Wrestling was also pretty good too, I suppose, but not all of the time. Yes, we all enjoyed watching legends like Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Undertaker, Steve Austin, The Rock, Mick Foley, Ultimate Warrior, Triple H, Randy Savage, Diesel. Jesus Christ, we were spoiled rotten back then. But not every character or gimmick was a winner, and the company had a propensity to unleash the seriously strange on its audience with shocking frequency. Whether it was the golden, new generation, or attitude eras, you could count on Vince McMahon and the creative bigwigs at Titan Towers to come up with some utterly bizarre creation that often had us reaching for the remote with our head in our hands. Wrestling is inherently pretty bloody silly, yes. Sorry, Jim Cornette, please don't shout at me. But some of these, which I'm sure sounded much better in the writer's room after a drink or ten at 4am in the morning, made it practically impossible to suspend disbelief and sometimes even enjoy the show. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 strangest WWE gimmicks of the 90s. Join us. Number 10, Isaac Yankum. Nobody likes going to the dentist, unless you're a nerd who enjoys being told they have no cavities at all. WWE tried to exploit what is a genuine fear for some folks with the evil dentist Isaac Yankum DDS. It was the mid-90s and occupational gimmicks were all the rage, with poor Glenn Jacobs getting the call to be the dastardly tooth driller. Jacobs hated the gimmick, but it was a foot in the door and he committed to it. It was also quite the featured role for the rookie, as he had been brought in by Jerry Lawler to take down Bret heart as part of his long-running feud with the Hitman. That led to a high-profile match at SummerSlam, which proved to be the character's peak. It was simply too cartoonish and over-the-top to be taken seriously, even though Jacobs had plenty of size and a solid style. The gimmick originally came about due to a joke Bobby Heenan used to make about going to see his dentist, I yank him. He yanks him. Teeth. Get it? Well, not all of the brain zingers were winners, I guess. The character quickly fell down the card and then out of sight, with the mayor of Knox County being given the honor of portraying the fake Diesel. Number 9, Repo Man. Well, this may have been lost in translation for myself and other fans based outside of the United States because we don't really have Repo Men, at least not Repo Men who wear duster jackets and Zorro masks and carry tow ropes around anyway. It's usually just a big bloke in bad jeans called Barry Two Hands or Steve the Stone who will break your thumbs if you don't have the dough. The sneaky grappler's whole shtick was that he took great joy in taking away things from folks who couldn't afford to pay for them or, you know, just to be antagonistic, such as the time when he stole Randy Savage's hat. The man behind the mask can't blame creative for this dead duck, since it was actually Barry's own idea inspired by his previous job repossessing cars. Yeah, you'd definitely want to relive those glory years, wouldn't you? The character stuck around for a lot longer than most would have anticipated and had its moments, such as his feud with the British Bulldog, but ultimately it was a product of its kid-friendly time and too strange to last. Number 8, TL Hopper. Of the influx of occupational gimmicks in the mid-90s, the goon, Duke the Dumpster Drosy, etc., the strangest of the strange is probably T.L. Hopper. Hopper was a plumber, meaning that he cleaned toilets by day and wrestled at night, which doesn't really seem very hygienic and also speaks to the pay a so-called WWE superstar could expect to earn back then. The portly Hopper was played by Tony Anthony, who had enjoyed some success in the southeastern indies as Dirty White Boy. The former Smoky Mountain wrestling champion was one of many hired by WWE to fill out their undercard during the lean years and was introduced to the audience through a series of vignettes which showed plenty of arse cleavage. He carried his trusty plunger, Betsy, to the ring with him and he would rub it in the face of opponents after victories, which wasn't often, since he was primarily used as an enhancement talent. Realizing his career was being flushed down the drain, Anthony took a hiatus and hung up his stained wife beater, trading it in for dungarees and a John Deere cap when he returned as Uncle Cletus, the short-term manager of the Godwins. The creative equivalent of taking a dump, this gimmick really stunk. Number 7, Xanta Claus. Many of the gimmicks on this list had an obviously short shelf life, but only one of them could be relevant for literally weeks, perhaps even just days, out of the calendar year. And that would be the evil Xanta Claus, the Kris Kringle from the dark side that was unleashed on the WWE Universe at the December 1995 In Your House Seasons Beatings pay-per-view. 
Hailing from the South Pole and on a mission to steal your presence, Santa Claus was played by the man who would go on to become Balls Mahoney. I mean, it's not often that a character with the first name Balls is the lesser of evils, but here we are. He attacked Savio Vega, who was handing out presents to fans at ringside at the behest of the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. Santa Claus made a couple more appearances, including one on Raw and a quick victory over Scott Scotty Too Hotty Taylor at a Superstars taping before the season came to an end and Santa Claus was chucked away like that ugly Christmas sweater you got from your auntie Nora. Short-lived or not, the ridiculous character bombed and brought everyone involved the opposite of holiday cheer. You know what, if you want a proper, full-on, demented Santa played by a wrestler, check out Bill Goldberg in Santa's sleigh. Actually, on second thoughts, don't. Number 6. Beaver Cleavage while some of the oddball characters from the Halcyonic 90s were merely eye-rollingly lame or otherwise silly but inoffensive, Beaver Cleavage truly pushed the envelope when it came to bad taste. The unlucky recipient of this Russo-inspired abomination was Chaz Mosh Warrington, who needed something to do after his headbanger teammate went down with a knee injury. In this case, he would have probably been better off sulking in catering and wrestling dark matches because Beaver Cleavage was a potential career killer. A parody of 50 sitcom leaving it to Beaver, it was an incestuous send-up of old-fashioned, wholesome family entertainment. In vignettes, the Beaver Cleavage character and Mrs. Cleavage traded sexual innuendo that hinted that the mother-son combination were far closer than they should have been. That's what we all watch wrestling for, isn't it? The incest aspect was shortly dropped via a work shoot promo, bro, where Chaz denounced the gimmick and it was retooled so that Mrs. Cleavage became his on-screen girlfriend, renamed Mariana, instead. But the fun times don't end there because things took a domestic violence turn as it was heavily implied on TV that Warrington was now beating her up backstage. Though it turned out that Mariana wasn't telling the truth because this was Vince Russo's late 90s WWE after all, and lest we forget, all women are liars. Number 5. The Berserker if he came along today, people would probably just call him a hipster, but back in 1991, the Berserker, who was an unhinged and wild-looking Viking, struck fear into the hearts of impressionable kids watching at home. With his wild hair, bushy beard, furry boots, horned helmet, shield and sword, the Berserker immediately caught attention and then kept it with his in-ring antics, particularly his off-kilter expressions and constant repetition of the word HUSS. His method for winning matches was certainly unique, as he would more often than not throw opponents outside the ring and take a count-out victory rather than pin them, running around and gesticulating wildly as the referee counted to ten. Huss! While the character was like a watered-down version of the man who played him, Jim Nord's former tag partner Bruiser Brody, he did occasionally escalate things, such as the time when he tried to give The Undertaker a Viking funeral and then almost impaled him on his sword, although ultimately settled for pile-driving the dead man on on the concrete floor. Huss! The Berserker wasn't great and was more than a little peculiar, but he left an impression despite being a thousand or so years behind the times. Huss! Number 4. Max Moon from the distant past to the unknown future now as we look at one of the biggest and most expensive flops in WWE history. The brainchild of Lucha Libre star Conan, Max Moon was a robot slash alien slash spaceman thing who wrestled in a bright technicolor costume and was supposed to make his entrance flying to the ring with the aid of a jetpack while shooting confetti out of a cannon attached to his wrist. Yep. The outfit cost a reported $13,000 to make, which was quite a bit of cash back then, and Vince McMahon and the creative minds behind the scenes put a lot of energy into ensuring that the presentation of the character was just right. Well, they tried to anyway. Regrettably, Conan had issues working the WWE style at the time, didn't like transporting the boxes of gear around himself, and also butted heads with some in the locker room. All that, coupled with his burgeoning success south of the border, meant that he left the company, burning that bridge in the process, after playing the role just a handful of times. The gimmick was then given to Paul Diamond, but it wasn't a hit, and Max Moon went back to his home planet after just a few months. Number 3. Damien Demento Damien Demento will likely only ever come up in conversation if you're at a pub quiz and one of the questions is, who wrestled in the main event of the first episode of Monday Night Raw? Because that is the main claim to fame of the performer who was billed as emanating from the outer, outer reaches, reaches of, of your, your mind. mind. I'm not entirely sure what exactly the gimmick was actually supposed to be, which is one of the main things that makes it so strange. He was supposedly demented, duh, and dressed weirdly with a devil worshipper's beard coupled 
wrestled with a Paul Heyman scullet, likely turning heads at the airport. In the ring, he was nothing special, just another big guy who liked to kick and punch and do the occasional chin lock or seven. The aforementioned Raw main event, losing to The Undertaker, is the main reason why anyone remembers him, since though he did make occasional televised appearances, he was mainly relegated to house show duty. Demento had a standout look and played the madman convincingly enough, and who knows, maybe with time the character could have been fleshed out a little and enjoyed more success. What I'm saying is, perhaps it's time to bring the Damien Demento gimmick back. What do you say? Your move, Luke Gallows. Number 2. Friar Ferguson and Bastian Booger Two rubbish gimmicks for the price of one now, as poor Mike Shaw was given two of the worst personas ever, one right after the other. The first, Friar Ferguson, was a supposedly drunk monk, making its epic debut on Raw in April of 1993. It didn't take too long for WWE to receive negative feedback from the Catholic Church of New York City, and the character was axed after that one and only match. Shaw disappeared for a month, and when he returned, it was as Bastian Booger. I mean, really, talk about falling arse first onto a cactus and then falling off the cactus and smashing your head into a rock, eh? The Booger character was a slovenly, gluttonous hunchback who wore what looked like duct tape lingerie to the ring and grossed out audiences by gorging on fatty cuisine. The gimmick was allegedly punishment for Shaw's failure to control his escalating weight. Yeah, give him a role where he has to eat pizza, cream cakes, and ham after matches. That'll get his waistline down. Booger was essentially a glorified jobber for most of the year and change that he was uglying up our screens, but he did have a feud with Bam Bam Bigelow and would have probably won the 1994 Royal Rumble if he didn't have to withdraw due to food poisoning. Number 1. Mantar They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Look at this picture. What else can really be said? I tell you, a thousand words come to mind while looking at that monstrosity, but most of them are four letters long and will probably get me kicked off of YouTube. Mantar was a total and utter disaster, a bizarre clunker of a character that is still used as shorthand today when describing the worst of the worst in sports entertainment. The concept of a minotaur come to life is, from the start, a stretch, even for wrestling fans with their tongue permanently planted in their cheek to accept, but the presentation just made everything so much worse. Poor Mike Halak. He was supposedly given the gimmick because someone in creative saw that his actual feet were somewhat hoofish, had to wear that bull's head, which was too big and cumbersome to enter the ring with and kept falling off, and then moo and charge at his opponents while wearing an unflattering black and brown singlet. The gimmick was DOA, and after some routine victories over even lowlier jobbers than himself, he was staring at the ceilings for the likes of Thurman Sparkplug Holly. Mantar was mercifully sent back to the farm within half a year. Total and utter bull... Ugh, you know.